Okay, apparently I am live. <laughs> um, sorry about that. We've been having some technical problems like everybody in this world, uh, the brave new world of ours. I'm waiting for Alexander Gabriel to join me. Hopefully he's having technical problems too. Um, I thought that video was was fascinating and uh, you know it's a it's a chance to uh, to see some things that you really don't see from distilleries that you really don't get a chance to tour so much. These are places without huge visitor centers and uh, and bus tours or anything like that. I mean, we're we're in the Caribbean. We're not in Scotland or or cognac or something like that. And uh, what is interesting to 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 me anyway uh, is how they have managed at these places to preserve some really cool uh, traditions against, uh, well, let's say through the 20th century, which was a pretty tough century for traditions in distilling and, and in everything else. I mean, the, the fact that uh, there's still muck pits used and dunder used in rum, that's fascinating. Uh, that's uh, very rare. Most rum today is uh, something that in up until the 1920s or 30s, if you told people how how it's made, uh, if you told people in the Caribbean, if you told distillers at places like uh, Long Pond and West Indies, etc., they wouldn't believe you. That's not how you made rum. Uh, in the 19th century, 18th century, going back even to the late 1600s, rum was always made from the skimmings that you took off of uh, sugar vats as you were boiling down the sugar. Uh, the sugarcane juice, rather, to 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 get sugar from it, and uh, you mix that with uh, eventually with the dunder, the 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 spent wash from a previous distillation, if you had it. Uh, if not, you might throw in some cane juice, uh, and then uh, you let that ferment for a day or so, and then you threw in the, then you threw in a bunch of molasses. So it was always made from these three things: uh, dunder, molasses, and uh, and skimmings. Nowadays, molasses and water is, is is what's used. And there were people making rum like that uh, back in the day, but that was in New England, not in, uh, in uh, the Caribbean. But we see that uh, people have worked around, you know, that change in raw materials and managed to preserve these very interesting flavor profiles. Uh, but uh, partly it's through techniques like using uh, retorts, like like we saw at uh, Clarendon, or uh, using uh, dunder and and uh, and uh, the muck pit, as we saw at uh, Long Pond, and uh, also using um, the three chamber still, which is a very interesting and, as you saw, a very cool piece of technology. I mean, it's basically taking one of those retort stills and stacking it all up in one column and uh, running steam through it. <laughs> it's very clever, very simple. Uh, it was an American invention You here in the U.S. around uh, the early 1800s. Uh, they were often made out of wood because uh, you were running steam through it, and that uh, swelled the wood up and kept it from leaking, and uh, wood was cheap. Every Every distillery had a cooperage. Uh, not every distillery at a copper works. So uh, this uh, this sort of museum of uh, of old distilling technology that we, that we were looking at, uh, I mean, covers a lot of traditions of, of uh, here in the new world. And most of the distilling manuals and uh, writing about distillation uh, focuses on the old world. It focuses on places like uh, Scotland and Cognac and... Uh, and uh, it doesn't really dig deep into these uh, new world traditions. So I'm, I'm really think it's it's uh, time to do much more research on the new world traditions in the rum industry because they're they're very diverse and they're very interesting because they they, they all have uh, uh, you know different goals. There are some people trying to make a very very clean light product uh, other people are were, were trying to preserve the the funkiest richest part of the cane and uh, you've got all these traditions that do that um, hoping I'm hoping Alexander's going to join us but uh, in the meanwhile uh, why don't you start asking some questions and we'll see what happens I'll answer as much as I can if anybody's got any um, 
I'm looking at the comments right now. There uh, is nothing right now, but uh, okay. I see some people are typing. Uh, that's good. <laughs> this is uh, this is all kind of on the fly. Oh uh, wait, I see there's a Q and A tab. I'm in the green room here. I've got the Q and A tab, and I see there uh, the box has got a lot of people. Uh, Okay, let me see, let me see, let me see. Okay, uh, well, I'm looking in the uh, Q&A box and uh, I don't see any questions yet. I see Matt, Matt Petrick is here and uh, Matt's one of the people who's been doing a ton of research on uh, historic rum and uh, especially on British Navy rum and uh, the, uh, the 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 complexity of all that. So uh, that's that's fascinating, I think. And uh, you know, uh, what one of the things that uh, is unique to the rum tradition uh, is that um, most up up until the 1960s, most rum was made over in. Uh, the Caribbean, and then shipped and blended and matured uh, for long maturation uh, in, uh, in in Europe. So uh, a lot of the, uh, the – there's not really an integrated supply line between there, and some of the knowledge is broken up over there. Okay, now I see I'm getting some questions. Yes, yeah, saltwater fermentation is a, is a fascinating thing that you see – used by some producers in the Caribbean. You know, the Caribbean was very, uh, it was very much producer by producer. Uh, there were no trade associations really or industry uh, standards. Everybody made their own rum as they saw it, uh, you know, with some common techniques. And then they would ship it back to Europe for, for like I said, for blending, et cetera. And the European blenders uh, bought the different marks to, to give them the flavors they needed. But uh, saltwater fermentation is kind of a neat trick because it does two things. Is One, you've got the uh, salt water that um, stresses the yeast a little bit. And uh, that stress uh, me- makes the yeast tougher, which means it can withstand higher level of alcohols in fermentation before dying, which means it will keep eating sugars and excreting them and making still higher alcohol. Um, so that's part one. Uh, there's also something that happens in distillation with, uh, if you've got uh, salt in the still, and this is an old distillers trick you see in, uh, like American rye whiskey distillers in the early 1800s were doing this. Various people were doing this. Uh, it goes back into the 17th or uh, 1700s in England is a little bit of, of common salt thrown in the still, uh, raises the boiling point of the mash just a couple degrees. But, you know, the way distillation works, you've got uh, water and alcohol in there and you're working, you're kind of surfing the difference in boiling points between them. And anything that raises the boiling point of water means you can break off more alcohol before the water starts coming through the still, which means you can get a purer first run. And that purity is money. You know, that's uh, that's something that's, uh, you know, that's strength and, and purity in the spirit. And uh, so uh, the salt water is, is really good for that. It's it, it gives you higher uh, alcohol in the fermentation and then higher alcohol in the distillation, too. So it's pretty cool. It's uh, it's interesting. OK. Uh, there's a question on the booster of cane acid and how it's used that I would need Alexander to talk about. Uh, however. Uh, you know that that comes in in uh, in uh, especially in the in the dunder pit, uh, and uh, it uh, is uh, you know you you get these these high levels of acidity that comes through the still and uh, builds builds a lot of flavor. Um, but again, that's not my specialty. Uh, there's a question: Will we? be releasing some Vulcan rums 
100% or will this be used in blends? Unfortunately, I don't work for uh, for plantation. I'm just a friend of uh, of Alexander's uh, with, a, with a strong interest in rum. So I can't answer that, but I have tasted uh, 100% Vulcan rums that they've made. So I'm assuming sooner or later you'll be able to taste them too, because that's the whole point of making them. Um, I see Matt Petrick uh, saying, maybe talk about the work of H.H. Cousins and J.C. Nolan. Uh, I didn't actually uh, review any of this stuff because I am doing this uh, waiting for Alexander. <laughs> and uh, we were going to have a pleasant conversation, and now I have to give a lecture. Um, but uh, there are people, uh, especially in Jamaica, who did do a lot of research on uh, it back in the 19th century on rum making. And they published in specialized journals like the Sugar Cane which and uh, the Journal of the uh, Jamaican Agricultural Institute. I think that's what it's called. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, that stuff didn't really make it into the official history of rum uh, as it's been told to us. That stuff was, was hard to find, and until uh, especially until recently. Now you can uh, uh, get it uh, parts of it online, and uh, now we know that it's there. Uh, there's a lot of also research in Germany on the uh, on the effects of some of the yeasts that uh, are used in tropical distillation, some of the yeasts that are allowed to uh, to to grow in the fermentation. It's not just European uh, Saccharomyces. There's also uh, Schizosaccharomyces, a complete or Pombe yeast, which is uh, for, first identified in Africa but occurs throughout the tropics. That uh, doesn't throw off as much alcohol, but it throws off all kinds of uh, uh, oils and, uh, and 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 flavor compounds that are unavailable otherwise. And that's why you get some, uh, once you get these tropical fermentations, uh, you get some very funky, uh, very funky rums going on. And uh, so that's, that's always interesting to me is, is once you get into that stuff. Uh, but uh we will see uh okay uh let's see i'm seeing uh some more questions uh just give me a moment here uh Uh, most of these are questions that Alexander would have to answer, unfortunately, because again, I don't work for Maison Ferrand, but, uh, there, you know, there's an announcement in June to rebrand, brand the plantation line of rums. Uh, uh, you know, people have been asking about that and, you know, this is something that's been, uh, I know I, I've discussed it with Alexander before and it's, uh, it's something, uh, that, that, uh, has been considered, but, you know, it's a huge thing to do for a small brand, especially uh, that uh, has built its, uh, its, its presence uh, by bottles on the bar more than by advertising or anything like that. And suddenly, if the bottles on the bar are very different, uh, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, has to be done right. And it's something that uh, is, is a little bit frightening. But, uh, you know, I, I know they're working on it. And it takes time to find the right brand. I, I've seen all kinds of names have been uh, thrown out, and uh, and you know I threw a few of my my own into the hopper until what my favorite one turned out to mean something really bad in a language that I don't even speak. So uh, these are the kinds of issues you have to deal with, and uh, we'll see uh, we'll see what happens uh, with with that. Um, a further, I see there's a further question about. Uh, upcoming releases uh, uh, with uh, saltwater fermentation. I know Alexander likes to experiment. That's all I could say. Um, you never know. Um, let me go back. Okay, I see Alexander is here in the discussion, able to answer some technical uh, questions. Maybe, uh, Alexander, uh, let, let, me, let me see. Uh, let me type uh, something. Uh, 
Okay. All right, we've got a whole bunch of people typing now, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Fun and games. I hope everybody's been enjoying their tales. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> it's nice to see you, even uh, even virtually like this. Uh, uh, I hope you're okay and doing okay. Okay, uh, so, you know, as Alexander's saying, uh, acidity promotes the formation of esters, and if you can get, you know, more acids in there, uh, it, it's it's a good thing. And, uh, you know, part of the, there's acids in dunder uh, left over from, you know, from, from, from distilling. There are further acids uh, in things like, cane trash that often goes into mock pits that's the tops and leaves and uh and and pieces of cane that haven't been uh uh, uh used for for sugar making uh so it's it's very cool oh and then and then there's of course the vinegar with cane juice which is a a further technique and so it's basically just sour cane juice as alexander is saying Cane stalks added mostly for bacteria and yeast. Yeah, that goes way back. That was that's an old tradition. Um, in the 19th century, uh, some Jamaican distillers they just had like a vat that they just kept a- anything that was left over or that had spilled or whatever just went into that vat, and it just stayed there. And it just kind of it was kind of like a pot au feu. It would stay on the back burner, so to speak, and bubble away and. Uh, as they were tasting their uh, their their rum or, or especially their uh, their uh, fermentation, uh, if it seemed like it was thin or low in flavor, they would just get a ladle and ladle in some of this stuff from the from the funk vat, and that that gives us the the the, the beginnings of the muck pit. Okay, now Alexander's uh, doing. Uh, weighing in with some good stuff. Yeah, precisely the fiber adds fur for all and other other things that uh you know eventually will come through in flavor. The question are they still pro- producing that high concentration rum for Germany? Not just for Germany, it's part of the global rum trade now. Uh, it's, you know, it's one of the blender's tools. Uh, I mean, uh, if you go through uh, one of the international rum brokers, they've got a line of Grande Rome and High Ester High ester rums, and uh, it's uh, these are things that you can uh, use to juice up your rum. I don't think they're used often enough, frankly, but uh, that's me. Uh, and yes, high ester rum is also used for candies, cookies, baking, as is Batavia Arak, which is essentially a high ester rum, uh, and uh, it's used very much in the fragrance industry, uh, partly because it's very uh, persistent. It's pungent and it has a, a depth of flavor that you get from these uh, from from the long fermentations and uh, and a fairly low proof distillation. Yeah, exactly. These are used for chocolate making, for instance. Uh, you know, anything that you want to add uh, another layer of flavor to. So it's it's very interesting for that.
Oh, I see. Here's a question from Matt Petrick about uh, recent history about the re-rise in popularity of Jamaican rum. Um, in the in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, rum was really kind of struggling, especially the high flavored, rich, funky rums. The world was moving towards lightness. Uh, it was moving towards high balls rather than punches. Tiki drinks were, tiki was basically dying and that was the last bastion of high flavored rum. And there was really not much of a market and the rum makers, you know, they had to, they had to survive. And one of the ways that they survived was by making a mellower rum. They were taking out some of that funk that was putting off consumers and kind of following the idea of bourbon where you've got a rich, mellow, smooth spirit with a lot of oak on it. And, uh, and you know, it, locally, they were still saying still selling high ester rums. That's what people were still drinking in the islands because this is their heritage and that's what people drink. But for the export market, you were getting more and more rums. Uh, that, you know, they were good rums. They were rich and tasty, but they weren't very uh, sugar caney or aromatic. Uh, and... Uh, this gets us into like the 1980s, 1990s, and uh, the, the 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 rich stuff is really going away. Uh, by 2000, you couldn't really find a pure pot still Jamaican rum, for instance. Jamaica had made pure pot still only until the 1950s, kind of like Ireland, uh, the the Republic of Ireland did uh, in the 1950s. Like in Ireland, they had to put in column stills and start blending because of uh, the trade of the market and also prices going down. Uh, you know, uh, spirits and cocktails were kind of fading. Uh, people were getting into other intoxicants and and uh, the world was changing. People were drinking less. Uh, now the world's back <laughs> uh, because have you seen the world lately? But anyway, um, so uh, when I was writing Imbibe, I had a really hard time uh, – testing some of the uh, Jamaican rums, uh, the, the drinks that called for, for heavy Jamaican rum. Uh, and uh, it was, it was really tough to, uh, to get my hands on those. The closest I could get was inner circle rum from Australia, which was a pot still uh, molasses rum, like the uh, Jamaican rums were, but, you know, without the, some of the traditional tricks that the Jamaicans had mastered. So it was still a good funky rum. And uh, when Imbibe came out, uh, Eric Seed, the importer at House Alpence, asked me what spirits I'd be interested in seeing on the market, you know, as we were having a drink at the uh, late lamented Pegu Club. Uh, so uh, what I said was, I want a Jamaican pot still rum at, you know, at strength, at uh, the original British proof, like 100, uh, 114, 116 uh, proof, or 57, 58 ABV, which is, uh, was the original. And I, he asked around, uh, I think Audrey Saunders seconded that uh, emotion, and uh, he managed to source some, and we tried it, and that came out of Smith & Cross. That was the first pure pot still rum in a long time. Uh, people eventually uh, started catching on that this stuff is great. And we're also uh, sort of benefiting a little bit from the uh, premiumization of rare bourbons and uh, bourbon collectors are starting to look at other things. And so uh, this started to get very, uh, very cool and very interesting. Uh, you start to get, we're starting to get some of these high ester funky rums. Now to address Sean Frederick's uh, question here, it says we're blessed with a spectrum of Jamaican rum styles today. That's incredibly diverse. Uh, what was, what wasn't historically accurate Jamaican drinking rum. Most of the uh, Jamaican drinking rum uh, in England, they were blending really what, what uh, finally came down to two styles or three styles. Uh, Wedderburn was the highest esters, and that wasn't as high as the continental, uh, the super funky, funky flavor bombs that were used only for blending. Uh, you could get bottles of pure Wedderburn rum. Wedderburn is a style and a grade. It used to be a producer. It was a big slave-owning family who uh, went broke, when, fortunately, when slavery was uh, abolished. And uh, 
but they had been famous for making a very high grade of rum and and some of their uh, their estates uh, are still in the rum business and still make a high grade of rum uh, uh some of their marks that is still survive uh but the the main rum that we you saw was something called common clean and this is this is something that was uh, these 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 uh categorizations were put together really in the 1930s just to codify a 19 between the 1910s and the 1930s to codify what people were already doing and common clean was much lower in esters it wasn't low 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 it, it was it was higher in esters than most rums on the market today but it wasn't super funky it had some funk and it had some rich body but it didn't go nuts and that was the real popular one that was the one that uh, if they were doing blends of Jamaican rum, they'd use mostly that, and then they'd flavor it up with some of the more highly flavored grades. Uh, and this stuff would be uh, pretty rich. Uh, I mean, there is a plantation one that I think is close. It's more, it's, it's in the plumber uh, range, which is in between Wetterburn and Common Clean uh, in terms of esters, but it, 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 kind of evokes this common clean and that's the plantation kaimaka which i find very good for mixing because it isn't a complete ester bomb it's not just all funk it's it's got some subtlety to it and it's very rich in texture and that richness in texture i think is uh the thing that uh, jamaican rum always had that was what distinguished it more from the uh from the also very funky but but different uh demerara rums is the Jamaican was pure pot still. The Demerara was uh, a mix of pot and column starting at least in the late 19th century. Demerara was working uh, very hard on, on mixing stuff in. Yeah, uh, Appleton is close to common clean. It's definitely, I, I would say, you know, the, the richer Appletons are, are uh, probably in that range, but most of those are blends of pot and column. So they're going to be a little bit lighter than uh, than the pure pot still common clean. Uh, Richie Cruz asks, would you have tasted our rums in the Philippines? I've tasted some Philippine rums. Uh, my favorite thing from the Philippines is Lambanog, which can be very lovely, which is a, a type of spirit that nobody ever talks about, unfortunately made from palm sap. Uh, that stuff is great. Um, yeah, the Australia, they were also using the Pombe yeast. It was tropical, this uh, uh, fermentation uh, in Queensland, which is, you know, just south of Papua New Guinea. And that's pretty tropical. You don't get much more than that. So uh, in hot countries, you get the Pombe yeast flourishing. And uh, that really makes a huge difference in uh, in in the flavors of these rums. And it gives, uh, there, there's a whole belt around the world where where you can get that and that that's pretty lovely uh let's see if i'm missing stuff here i hope uh sean frederick i hope i answered your question sort of um Eugene, I don't know if we're going to see more co uh, collaboration with African rum producers. Sometimes that's gone well. Sometimes you end up with something uh, where they've taken out uh, the the African rum has been almost denatured. I'm not going to name brands, but I've had some pretty flavorless rums from Africa and some absolutely fantastic ones. And I think the flavorless ones are due to international commerce, not because of what they're that's what they're making. Um, Maybe Alexander can touch on the uh, plantation brand name. Uh, I'm going to go back to this. Uh, I see there's a question from Corey. Good rums for an 18th century punch. You really want uh, a pretty rich, pure pot still Jamaican rum. Jamaican, Jamaica took over and became the engine of uh, British Rum. There was also some some rum uh, that was coming from from some of the smaller British islands. There was uh, Saint Kitts had uh, had some pretty funky rums, uh, but uh, for an 18th century punch, I mean, I would I what I do myself is a blend of uh, Plantation Kaimaka and uh, Smith and Cross, uh, probably a two to one blend, and that works very well for me. Uh, 
I see Steve Craspel asked, what's a punch that has to be made with a funky Jamaican rum? Any rum punch, as far as I'm concerned. I think they're always better. I'm a Jamaican rum fiend. Uh, Bayesian rum, also very good. That's another great one to blend, uh, especially you, if you've got some funky uh, uh, higher ester Jamaican rums. Uh, use a little of that and then some uh, some of the uh, the, the mellower uh, just kind of smoother uh, Bayesian rums. That works great too. Uh, there's some lovely Bayesian rums, and and I really do hope, Alexander, that uh, that uh, some of the uh, the Vulcan rums uh, do come out soon. All right, I'm just uh, seeing what else we've got here. Uh, Megan Davenport says, uh, what are a few cocktails I should be making with high ester rums? Uh, I use it mostly in punches, but, you know, one great thing to do is to make what's known as the Palmetto cocktail, which is a rum Manhattan. Use Angostura bitters, two to one, uh, sweet vermouth and uh, a good pot still rum. That's a delicious drink. That's a fine drink. Very simple, but... uh, you know the 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 as the vermouth does with all the other spirits you mix it with it smooths it out it it blends and extends the flavor and uh with and, and without uh thinning out the texture and it lets the uh the rum open up and that's just a fine drink uh Jared Craven asks a little bit about uh for more on retort stills uh retort stills is something that you start to see uh, people playing with in the late 19th century uh, in all over Europe. Uh, and uh, it gets to the Caribbean 1830s, 1840s, as far as I can, 1830s, I believe. And it's an immediate hit there because uh, it's very simple to do. They're very simple to make. And uh, it saves a lot of fuel. It saves a lot of time. It's much less labor intensive than the Kodak process. Uh but it gives you a lot of flavor. It gives you a rich, uh, full-bodied uh, distillate. Um, basically, like I said, uh, the the three-chamber still is, is sort of a similar version because you're using the uh, the uh, vapor coming off the still. It condenses in the first retort, which you can either pre-fill or let it condense and fill itself up. And then the alcohol, the the vapor bubbles through that liquid. And uh, that is uh, sort of, it's doing the work for you. You know, it's, uh, you're, you're just letting uh, another distillation happen without uh, pretty much hands off. It's it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, you're, you're using the physics of the whole thing to do the work. And uh, it's, it's a very smart and uh, way of of making this work. Uh, I see other favorite classic cocktails to sub rum with. Kingston Negroni is a good suggestion. Uh, Dykery, of course, you know, anything with lime juice. Um, Planter's Punch is always a favorite of mine. And, uh, oh, uh, Mint Julep. Try it. It's, it's The original Mint Julep was made with rum in Virginia in the 1770s. That's what they drank. Uh, whiskey was really just a gleam in people's eyes. It was it was new then and uh, not very fashionable. So the fashionable people in Virginia were drinking mint juleps. A tea punch recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I kind of prefer a lighter rum in that, but uh, that's just me. That it's certainly not gonna it's not gonna taste bad. Uh, there also high ester rum, a float of that on top of a cognac mint julep is a fine, fine thing. That's, that was the mint julep as known in America in the, uh, 1830s, the great African-American bartenders of Virginia 
were uh, were mixing hailstorm juleps with tons of ice and uh, huge mint garnishes and uh, all kinds of fancy touches. And there was always a rum float on that. Brandy, bo- brandy body rum float. That's a fantastic. Hi, Debbie Ann. <laughs> uh, drinks with Arak. I always make punch with Arak, but uh, there are a couple of cocktails that, that I've come up with, but uh, I don't really, uh, uh, there aren't any standard ones. I have a book of Arak cocktails from the 1930s uh, and uh, that Jim Meehan kindly uh, lent me the uh, images of. And uh, it's amazing how few of those drinks I've actually made. <laughs> Arak for me is always in punch. And uh, that's, that is just, it's, it, it shines there like nothing else. See what else we've got here. Uh, question about Haitian Clarins. You know, those are fascinating. Uh, not easy to get uh, your hands on. I mean, the world of rum is very complicated, while at the same time being very simple. I mean, you've got... Uh, you know, you, you, you've got simple raw materials and you're just making them work. Uh, uh, Sugarcane is, is, is a miraculous plant. Uh, very cool. And, uh, you know, the diversity that you can get out of that one plant, uh, whether you're doing the juice, the molasses, uh, whether you're boiling down the juice into syrup, whether you're distilling from sugar, which is historical and some people still do. Uh it's very cool. Uh, ciao, Ricardo. Tutto bene, speriamo. Uh, vorrei venire a Roma presto. Um, yeah, I could use a float too, <laughs> Adrian. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Jules uh, Jules asks if I'm working on any exciting projects for the future. I'm in the final stages of wrapping up the uh, Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, which I've been working on for eight or nine years at this point, from, you know, figuring out what entries we're going to have to now editing the final entries. And uh, it's a hell of a project. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but uh, it's almost done, and hopefully it'll be out at the end of next year. Uh, something like 1,100, 1,200 entries uh on all kinds of things on bartenders uh biographies of, of, of famous bartenders of famous bars a lot on distillation based on original sources we're trying to get back to primary sources rather than you know copying uh one book saying that copied from another book uh that copied from another book that copied from another book you know in modern times we're trying to to to, to kind of go back to uh the vast pool of knowledge that was out there uh, uh, at the time when when these spirits were created. And uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. So hopefully uh, that will provide uh, a big uh, wad of stuff for people to read, and uh, hopefully people will be interested in it. I, I'll be very happy to be finished with it. Um, let's see. Uh, Forrest Coakley says, my distillery is a two retort. The first and second retort is distilling on the heat from the pot, from the pot still, softer, deeper, richer. Uh, what, which is your distillery? I, I have lost track, unfortunately, but that's, you know, that's awesome. Uh, let's see if we have any further Oh, uh, okay. We need Alexander to talk about how do you suppose fermentation will be affected at Long Pond with the new vats? Will there be a major difference in taste compared to the previous ones? Uh, I would that I would like to. Uh, I'm curious about that myself. I, I mean, I know that's a tough. Uh, it's a tough thing to match. 
uh, Jessica Spector talks a bit, says, can you talk a bit about botanical rums, rums with herbal, herbal infusions? These are, of course, very uh, traditional in the Caribbean. And going back to Barbados in the 1650s, one of the things they were doing is distilling cane with anise and making an anisette out of uh, anise was a almost universal, uh, uh, what Alexander calls a cover. It's the kind of thing that if your distillation is a little bit iffy and you distill it with anise, uh, you'll taste the anise much more than you'll taste the iffy distillation. So uh, that's, uh, th that's, a, that's a long tradition of that. Uh, but uh, in the Caribbean, uh, a lot of the uh, herbal infusions are, are uh, you know, deeply traditional, medicinal. Uh, they all have their purposes, uh, most of which I, I can't uh, really discuss on a family broadcast like this. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, it, it's really quite, uh, quite ingrained in the culture. And uh, every island, every part of every island has their own. And uh, this is something that... Uh, you really don't see much in the export market. Uh, I would like to see more, uh, but uh, who knows? You really have to go down there and uh, and put them in your suitcase. Uh, any further questions or comments? Am I missing anything here? I don't see. Uh... Either uh, either places. Um... A couple of people typing here more, more questions. Uh, I'm happy to do my best. I don't know what happened with Alexander. He seems to have dropped out again, unfortunately, but uh... We'll go, I'll go for a couple more minutes anyway, if anybody's still here. And uh, we'll call it a day. Hello, Alexander. Okay, uh, are we... Okay, yeah, I'm putting Alexander on speaker here. Let me crank the volume. Let's see if Hello, this works. Everyone. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you can all hear me. I saw some beautiful questions, and I want to thank David for doing such a good job. <laughs> well, thank you, Alexander. Uh, the big question is, uh, you know, there, 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 there are questions about uh, the plantation rebranding. Uh, I don't know if this is the place to talk about that, but there's also a, a lot of questions about uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Vulcan steel rum and if that's coming to market. Let's start with that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I don't know if everybody hears me. The plantation rebranding, as you know, as a team, you know, with our team in Barbados, also spoke with the team in Jamaica, we had decided to evolve the brand name we are better at making rum than creating brand names, so we're working very hard at it right now to evolve the brand name. We're working on it. You know, we don't want to do it halfway. We want to do it right, so that's what we're doing really uh, on, a, on an everyday basis. So this is where we are right now. And uh, the other, yeah, go ahead. Yes, they did the other. Yeah, sorry. The other questions about the Vulcan, and I saw that for some reason. Uh, you know, I'm in Cognac right now. I don't know what's happening with the connection, but uh, or, or my connection to Tails. But uh, the uh, the questions of the Vulcans were really fascinating. Uh, one person was saying that the, the Vulcan is actually made 100% from copper. It's an old spill from the 19th century. It doesn't look that way because, you know, in the old days, people didn't necessarily... Uh, you know, uh, and like to make the, 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 the spills as pretty and having to polish them. You know, now you have a, a heat resistant, uh, heat resistant varnish that you don't have anymore. So in the past, you had to clean them all the time. 
So at one point they were fed up with it and they decided to paint it with, uh, you know, with heat resistant paint just on the outside. So the still is actually 100% uh, uh, copper, like most of it. And if you look, we have an old uh, top still, a Greg Farm still, which was actually from 1850. That's the last. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. You know, a double batch still, right, David? You know that one. And yeah. also it looks painted, it looks that it's actually 100% copper. So these very old keys like this, they're like an old stove. They've been painted from the outside, so not to have to, to clean all the time the copper. We were thinking stripping them at one point now and put a heat-resistant, uh, you know, uh, on it, uh, varnish would look much better, I agree. You know, uh, a lot of that stuff uh, with with the, with the gleaming copper, et cetera, is stuff that's happened since the invention of the visitor center. I think. <laughs> You're right. I mean, it's it's my, you know it's the look. I mean, I love copper. Yeah. In the old days, they they worried more about what's how, uh, happening inside the still than outside the still. So that's why they've been you know painted yeah. over. And sometimes, if you go to Long Pond, the stills are actually covered with plaster. <laughs> you know, when you break your arm, right. you put plaster on your arm. You know, they use that same plaster, you know, shredded plaster around it, to use uh, the heat in insulation, right? Yeah. Because now people want to show the copper, but actually the best way is to hide it away so you don't lose the heat. You know, you insulate your, your stills. And in the old days, they knew better, and they did insulate the uh, the stills with, uh, with plaster. So when you look at these oldies, you know, at Long Pond, they don't get that for funny because they're insulated with uh, with plaster. So that's yeah. why you're uh, you're seeing these different things. That's a very old way of doing it and very primitive, obviously, and, and still works wonderfully. I mean, that was the old Dutch way, and everybody in the Caribbean learned how to distill from the Dutch. So, you know, the Dutch, all their stills were, were, were heavily jacketed with just the head sticking out, just the part that you had to take off. Um, Debbie Ann uh, asks, uh, what new innovations are you looking for relating to rum? And uh, I, I want to the, the one I'm most interested in is uh, trying to get back to that original rum with uh, uh, skimmings from sugar cane from from boiling down the cane with uh, dunder and molasses and making from that just to to learn what that did because right now nobody really does that and. Uh, those rums have faded so far into the past, and I would really love that as a you know as an experimental line, maybe as a, as a as a as a uh, a rare uh, bottling. But uh, I mean, hopefully, we'll see that in the future because uh, that will help us a lot to to kind of reconnect rum with its traditions and to see where we're we're so, David, we, yeah. To jump on on this, yeah, I mean, you know, this is something you and I have been talking about for a long, long time. Uh, you know, uh, David, as the uh, one of the most knowledgeable person, obviously, about history of making spirits, one day came to me and I said, Alexander, all the rum that's out there on the shelves is not true rum. <laughs> of course, it was a bit, uh, he was being the agent provocateur, and, uh, and, and but he's right in a way that in the old days, you know, there was, there was some... Uh, some skimmings used in, and David has some, you know, uh, you know that, and the skimmings that you know is the form that is produced during the old way of making sugar. It's a lot of protein, by the way, a bit like the form when you make milk, you know, mm -hmm. if, you, if not you make it, if you boil it, right? So in the old days, that was, you know, they didn't want to waste this, so, you know, it was a very, very beautiful way to add some flavor to the fermenting vat by fermenting also the skimmings. So I'm going to give you a little breaking news, uh, David, and I think you know this in the back of your mind. We are working on this now. We're not going to Phenomenal. fill with this because you've got to actually make sugar by hand to be able to gather the skimmings and actually make rum <laughs> with it. So, <laughs> oh, boy. Well, if you need somebody to work the, work the vats, you know, I'll come down and take my, take my shift. <laughs> uh, David, that's, 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 I'm not going to forget this. We'll be, uh, we'll be doing this together. We'll be, we'll, in a beautiful place, actually. We'll be sweating and, our uh, asses off. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's a beautiful way. Also, David, there were some questions about us making rum with the chamber still. I mean, you are the person, David, that has put a uh, uh, limelight on the chamber still before we even, you know, talked about the chamber still at the West Indies Rum Distillery. And uh, 
you explained and you were able to dig it out from history because a lot of people think there's Collins Bill, there's Pop Bill, and there's a Chambers Bill, and you saw in the video uh, a summary of how it works. You know, uh, I was smiling because of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Don kept a few little secrets because there's a little uh, uh, air cooling system that adds as a report that was designed in 1893 that attached to it. But it's an incredible way to make rum, and it tends to favor the chocolatey uh, flavors that is mostly what we call the higher alcohol, you see? Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, the still is a way to select the flavors, and it tends to favor these flavors, and we're still trying to understand why. You know why that still has got these chocolatey, intense flavors. You know, uh, uh, if you if you distill the same base in the old Greg, you know, that double bash, you get some very ripe fruit flavors. And if you put it in the uh, chamber still, you tend to have more of these really raw chocolate notes taking over. So that's kind of very interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Also, I know from tasting the uh, chamber still. Uh, samples that 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 I tasted from 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 you, that it has extraordinary texture. You know, it's 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 a very rich rum, uh, which is 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 I think, you know, is great. I mean, it's 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 thick. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I was just to uh, go to a different spirit. I was looking through some uh, chemical analysis of rye whiskeys made in. 1906 and rye and bourbon whiskeys and uh, Overholt, which was made in a uh, chamber still, a huge copper chamber still, 11 feet in diameter. Uh, there, the 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 the, not, the amount of extract of in in that uh, whiskey was higher than any other that they tasted that they tested. So you know because it was it was just a thick 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 whiskey and and I, I think that's extremely useful yeah, in some. That- yeah, go ahead. That, that's a really, yeah, no, no, that's an interesting statement, David, because then you get a lot, you know, as you know, in a rum, to put it simply, you do have either the fruit forward, ripe fruit forward elements that come from the esters. Think yeah. Jamaica, for example, right? A beautiful Dutch Jamaican rum. And then you have the more, uh, at the, on the other side of the spectrum, you got this very thick, rustic, chewy, kind of elements that are, we call higher alcohols, but, you know, forget about the names, that, that are the favored by the, where, you know, by the chamber still. Yeah. And so that gives you in your brain when you taste this, you feel that really intense, rustic, mouth-feeling flavor that kind of grabs you by the taste buds kind of thing. And that's what gives you that sensation of thickness on the palate, whether it is made whether you start with a molasses for rum or actually, you know, with a wash for whiskey. And and you're absolutely right. It, it really creates a specific design of rum that is true to only that still. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I mean, you know, I can imagine that as a sipping rum very easily, you know, <laughs> with, with a couple you know, years of maturation. What, yeah, what the, yeah, what's true is that you're right. It gives me, because it's so full uh, uh, flavored in terms of these specific notes, it gives a great taste, you know, great, great potential for for uh, for aging as well. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, you know, because it's got these broad shoulders. So, yeah, really fascinating. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I mean, this is this is the diversity in in rum that uh, I think we're in danger of losing uh, as people are, are, you know, rum has has from time to time gotten into uh, this this idea that they ha- it has to be made according to the, the highest international standards, but the highest international standards are not evolved to deal with with cane, you know, with cane spirits. And I, I, I just hope it doesn't give up some of this diversity. That uh, that that uh, that's what makes it fascinating for me. Uh, I was just well, yeah. Go ahead. David, that's, that's why we both wake up in the morning, right? Yeah. Is, and uh, I know you and I call each other once in a while and to say, David, did you see this? Remember when I gave you a call? I remember I was at the distillery at West Indies Rum Distillery, and in the archives we discovered that they used. Uh, some uh, a little bit of seawater in the fermentation bag. Amazing, you know. And then I call, I call David, and I'm. I thought I was going to blow his mind, frankly, because we like to blow each other's mind, right? And I'm like calling David, <laughs> and I'm saying, David, by the way, seawater in the fermentation bag. And then David is like, wow, that's interesting. Actually, I said, I knew this because in Jamaica they were using a little bit of sea salt. So what does 
as it do. And sure enough, right after I put down the phone, uh, you know, I rolled up my, uh, you know, took off my shoes, rolled up the uh, pants, trousers, and with the team, we got a few buckets of seawater, <laughs> put it in the fermentation vat, you know, very high tech, as mm-hmm. you can imagine, wooden fermenting vat. Mm-hmm. And we did a fermentation, and you don't need to add a lot, you know, like two, three, four percent, and you create, you add, you basically add minerals in, in the fermentation uh, vat, and you create a different environment for the yeast to develop. And these minerals, don't think that the, the, the minerals go through distillation. They actually just create a different environment for the yeast to develop differently. And you end up, I think you tasted it, David, because you end up with something that's a little brackish notes. And actually, if you taste West Indies rum, distillery rum made 40 years ago, now you will understand. You'll scratch your Oh, mind. fascinating, and yeah. And actually, uh, with all due respect, and I love another distillery, as you know, and I'm related to it now, and it's such a privilege. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, a uh, uh, Clarendon distillery used to do its fermentation with a, a river called Salt River. And as the name indicates, it was uh, a little bit brackish. And I was also designing, if you take some very old uh, monument rum, you also have that little bright brackishness that comes from these minerals that were adding by the salt in the fermentation of that. So these things we think are fascinating. And David totally agreed with you about what you're saying, that we need to be able to preserve these standards. You know, it's the same with the wood barrels and all mm-hmm. these techniques need to be researched, preserved. And re, re, uh, you know, repractice. I mean, this is they make delicious rum. That's I've, what we do in the station every day. I've I've had nothing but you know, delicious rum from well, almost nothing but delicious rum from these traditions. So it's uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I think uh, it is. We, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, because I see a uh, an interesting question from India. Uh, yeah, about a different kind of still. Uh, We'll have to save that for next year for a for a uh, a seminar on distillation and on the uh, weird different types of pot still. Not weird, just just uh, ones that aren't usually seen so much. And I think at this uh, at this moment we'll sign off and say thank you to everybody and uh, take care. Thanks to everybody and David. I'm very grateful to you. You're gonna have any room you want. You're holding the and I want to say. Uh, I want to say thank you for everybody for their passion for great rum. This is such a wonderful spirit. And uh, my commitment, and I know David's commitment as well, and that's why we're brother in this, is to continue this research and to create environments where we can recreate these beautiful rums, but also get inspiration from these old techniques. You know, it's not about just cookie cuttering the path. It's more about getting great inspiration for that. Yeah. So watch out for many more rums to come. Phenomenal. Okay, bye all. Thank you.